Well, good morning, everyone. I guess you saw outside that we're getting a new roof. You're, it's like putting a sign up, your, your tithe dollars hard at work. So, like you see out on the, uh, out on the highway. So we're, we're getting a new roof and they're moving rather quickly. The, the back is done and a little portion of the front. And uh, so uh, just be careful. We, they do clean up on a daily basis, so there shouldn't be any nails out there, but uh, just be careful. Make sure there aren't any bundles of shingles falling off the roof. Well, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. And we gather in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace upon us, Lord, uh, a broken people, a people that you have undertaken to make covenant to stick with us. Even, Lord, our hearts tend to wander. I feel it prone to leave the one we love. And yet, Lord, you're always gracious and forgiving of us. I thank you that you're with us, regardless of our state, that you are faithful. And I pray that you might stir up in us your spirit this morning as we look at your servant Joseph, as we look at the example, as we learn the lessons that you'd have each one of us to learn. I pray that you would encourage our hearts, that you might strengthen us, Lord, to live and be more like you. So, Lord, here we are, your people, called by your name. I pray that you would do what is pleasing to you in our lives here this morning, even now, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so we're back in the book of Genesis. This is Joseph's incarnation, or uh, if you want to give it another name, it's how to have a dreamy prison ministry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I've always thought of that when it gets difficult for Christians, when it gets difficult for us to be able to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and to stand on truth in love, uh, the world is going to become increasingly more adversarial, if you haven't noticed that already. So um, I, I just always think about prison ministry for myself at some point in time. So uh, that's, that's what's going on in my mind. So just so that you know, this is where we are and where we left off last week was Joseph's temptation. We saw that he was delivered unto a man named Potiphar. He was subjected to slavery under him. He was picked out, probably out of the lineup and paid for. His brothers threw him in a pit previously. And so he's in a land that uh, he's virtually an alien. He doesn't know the language. He doesn't know the people. He certainly doesn't fit into the culture at all. And now he's been bought as a slave and is submitting himself to Potiphar, who's the chief executioner for Pharaoh. And so he's in obscurity. He was all of that and a bag of chips back home. But now that he's in Egypt, he's nobody. He's on the lowest plane. He's a slave in the house of an executioner in a, in a Gentile world. So it, that's the story of Joseph. But it Potiphar sees something in him. He sees this quality because God is with him and everything that he does prospers. Everything just turns to gold. Partially because God's with him. Partially because he has a good work ethic. And he doesn't, you know, he's not sleeping, slumbering, you know, catching a cigarette in, in the back of Potiphar's house, you know, on break. You know, he's not sneaking anything, you know, spending, you know, an hour and a half in the bathroom on the phone. He, he's not doing any of that stuff. He's putting it to work and God... In cooperation with God's will, he's doing what God would have him do, and God is blessing him because God's with him. Potiphar says, this, this kid's got it going. And it doesn't matter whether it's in the house and the household, everything that has to happen there with a large household, but also in the field. So this, this kid is gifted by God to be a good manager. And so he manages his home and he steps aside and he lets him run everything. And the only thing that Potiphar was concerned about was what he was eating. The only thing that he knew about was the plate in front of his face. Now that's called trust. He didn't look over his shoulder. He didn't have to worry about looking and see what he was doing. There wasn't this severe accountability. And this is a, an alien who's basically in his home, a 17-year-old kid, that he's given the, the full range of doing whatever he wanted to do. Now, no right-minded person would do that unless God were with somebody and they were impeccable in their character. And so we see that he gets tested. 
with this autonomy. You can do whatever you want, Joseph, uh, and as long as you're doing a great job, I won't cut your head off. That's essentially what it is. You know, but tomorrow if you mess up, I'll probably kill you. So he, he's living in that sort of an arrangement. It's not uh, this, this uh, lovely situation like he had at home where he was the father's favorite, where he was the only one in the eyes of his father and uh, all of his brothers hated him, but he was favored. He had a nice coat. You know, he, he, was, he was looking good. Not anymore. But wherever he goes, God's with him. And he suddenly rises up in the household of Potiphar. Except we see that there's a problem. We have a, we have a desperate housewife who has got her eye longingly on Joseph. And unfortunately, he's not up for this. And he says no. In fact, no is what we say all the time to things, right? Go ahead, you could tell me no. 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 See, you just did. You just proved me right. <laughs> and so he gets tested. She presses him and says, lie with me. Now, I'm not sure that that ever works as a line. But we, we've seen it used several times in Genesis. Uh, but he says, absolutely not. How can I do this and sin against God? You see, he has not only a good character towards the man who has bought him as a slave, but he also has a heart toward God. And he says, listen, there, I, there's nothing to prove here. I have nothing to gain and everything to lose by being with you. And beside, why would I sin against God and do such a thing? Your husband has trusted me with everything except you. Because you're his wife, and by the way, as though you forgot, and I will not do this thing because I don't want to sin against God. So he stands this test. And then she plies him day after day, the scripture says. So every day she's you know, skulking around every corner and propositioning him all the time, probably in front of the other slaves and in, in front of whoever, and doing it slyly. And yet, She's pretty brazen about it, so I imagine everyone knows what's going on. So he's now going to have to stand the test of saying no repeatedly. And you know, if you have a child screaming in your cart as you're going in the grocery store, and they're saying, no, but I want Swedish fish, <laughs> you know how hard it is to continue to say no, and say no, and say no, and then, of course, you're embarrassed and everybody's looking at you. And then there's a voice from overhead that says, could you please leave the building? You know, you... <laughs> but Joseph stands the test over and over. She's constantly coming against him and he's constantly saying no. And so he resists her and he's not going to compromise. Well, it happens one day there's nobody in the house. It's a setup. You get the idea? Uh, have you ever been set up? Oh, yes, you have. Because we have a tempter, don't we? We have an enemy of our souls. And you are being set up periodically. You're being tested by God and being strengthened in, by him in discipline. But you're also, there's a setup because we have an enemy, the devil. And he'll throw stuff in front of your face and tempt you. And then you have to exercise that two-letter word, which is? No. Beautiful. You guys got it. I, I can just go home. I'm done. And instead of... Instead of losing his character, he loses his clothing. She's got a hold of him in such a way, she must have a vice grip, you know, uh, hand, but will not let go. And instead of compromising and leaving his character there, he leaves his clothing there and runs outside naked. A Hebrew among Gentiles. And he does it anyway. Well, then... The problem is she goes and tells the men of the household, this man has brought this slave into our house and now look what he's tried to do. I screamed and yelled and then he, he left and ran and look, he left his coat here. And so she makes up this whole thing and she tells the other slaves in the household. And so now he's hated in the household. And he was the boss of everybody, remember? And he was cast off by his brothers. But now he's going to have to bear this unpopularity in the home. And then there's this test of a woman is now lying on him to her husband and she explains it to her husband and it doesn't say anything about Joseph trying to defend himself or a conversation or a complaint or an argument and Potiphar is angry. And we know he's angry not at Joseph because he knows what kind of man Joseph is. He's angry that he has to get rid of a servant 
who's so faithful and God is with him and everything he touches is blessed and he has to do this because he's married to a woman who's unreasonable. But he knows what kind of woman he has. He's not angry at Joseph or he would have cut his head off. If I was the chief executioner under Pharaoh and somebody went after my wife, my wife said they tried to lay with her. Yeah, I wouldn't have a problem. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd take my time and carve a nice little piece of wood for you to put your neck in. But he puts him in prison, which tells me he was angry, not at her, not at him, but at her. And so he puts Joseph in jail, even though he didn't do anything wrong. I don't know if you've ever had to suffer that kind of injustice, but when somebody accuses you of something you did not do, or accuses you of motives that you never had, how difficult that is to endure. And yet Jesus did that. Remember when he went up and he was before Herod, he wouldn't say a word. And he says, what's going on? You know, give me a miracle, something, Jesus. And Jesus did nothing. He kept his mouth quiet. And he went to Pilate, back to Pilate again. And Pilate says, listen, don't you hear all their accusations? And he goes, if I wanted to, I'd tell my father he'd send 10,000 angels down. So Jesus knew that saying something and defending himself was not going to help. And so he didn't say anything. In fact, he was sent for that very reason to give his life for us. So Jesus knew. And I think Joseph knew too. And he submitted himself basically to the hand of God. But how difficult that is to be unjustly accused and punished for it when you didn't do it. That's a very, very difficult thing to endure. And then he's in jail. But it's funny because wherever he goes, God is with him. God is with him wherever he goes. And it just so happens the jailer sees this kid and wherever it is that he is, he works and he's faithful. You know, he's cleaning up, he's taking care of his stuff, he's helping other people, and he goes, this kid's amazing. I gotta give him something else to do. In fact, that's what you should do to your own children, right? Hey, you're doing really well with this. You know, try cutting the lawn. Here you go. Let him go. Because how do you know somebody's capacity until they've been tested or until they've been trained? And so what happens is he gives him full range of the jail and he takes care of everything. I mean, everything. Now, here's a prisoner taking care of everything in the prison. You, you could make a jailbreak, right? You could get everybody together and, and make an insurrection, but he doesn't do that. He serves, and he takes care. He makes sure people get food on time, things are cleaned up. You know, he's talking to people. God is with this kid. It's an amazing thing. Wherever he goes, he thrives. Can that be said of you? Whatever it is that you do, whatever you put your hand to do, Scripture says, do with all your might. And when we do that, it gives glory to God, and God gives us the strength to be able to do that. And so here are the various things that he's been through, the, the test of his obscurity. And so he has to serve in obscurity where nobody knows who he is, nobody recognizes him, and he could get better, but he doesn't. He has authority, he has autonomy, he gets to do whatever it is that he wants to do. His priorities get tested as to whether he's going to serve God and do the right thing or whether he's going to give in to temptation sexually. And he doesn't. The temptation of making something else more important than God himself, he passes that test as well, the test of priority. So every one of these things, his vulnerability, where he's falsely accused, his unpopularity, everyone's against him. There's not one person that is for him. And then his insincerity of being accused of something he didn't do and then having to go to prison and being judged for something he didn't do. That's got to be really, really hard. And now he's in jail and that's got to be really hard to do. But nowhere, no matter where he is, like a weed, he just grows like a dandelion. doesn't matter, you know, if it's in the crack of cement, it's growing, you know, and it's, and it's kind of in your face. And that's what's going on with Joseph. And we talked last week about running to the Savior, running from temptation and running to the Savior because that's what we need to do. Uh, we closed with run to the Father, which uh, I thought was appropriate. So this week, we're going to look at his incarnation, his dreamy prison ministry. I want you to note God's hand in all of this, and I want you to notice the timing because God has perfect timing with everything that he does. You might see this, and if you haven't been through the story, you think, what a tragedy. Why would God allow this to be? Why would he let this happen? And I don't know if you've ever asked that question of your own life. 
Why did God let this happen? Why am I in this place? But here's Joseph, disowned by his family, thrown into a pit, made a slave, falsely accused, tested in every way possible, and he ends up in jail with no date to get out. And he's thriving because he's got his eyes on the Lord. And that's the key. So we're going to look at his prison ministry. Verse 1 of chapter 40. It began to, it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their Lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. And so he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. So the plot thickens here. It's interesting that God would bring people from the highest court in the land and put them in the same area as where Joseph was. You get the idea that the fix is in because God is moving. And so what do you think about coincidence? <laughs> do things happen on coincidence? I think things do. But then I think God's hand is also behind many things that we miss. I find it amazing. I'll be thinking about somebody and praying about somebody and I get a phone call and that somebody's on the phone. Yep. Things like that always happen. Always happen in my life. In fact, I'm not surprised. There are uh, young believers that I get to spend time with and they're like, isn't that amazing? And I'm like, I guess I'm over it. <laughs> because the Lord does stuff like that all the time. We were, we were just talking about that. Yep, yep, it's amazing. Or, or people that come up to me after service and they go, you were talking right to me today. I mean, I, I felt like I was the only one in the room. I, I'm not, I don't do that. I don't manufacture this stuff. I go verse at a time through what the scripture says. That's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you. And I'm glad because he does a much better job than I do. So these are not coincidences. These are things in which God is ordaining because, by his providence, moving and making things happen. Now, most people think of coincidence like this. Pi is 3.1416, you know, and it goes on. But if you turn it around, it looks like a P-I-E. So for some people, that's a coincidence, okay? So don't get, you know, don't get too freaked out. It's, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein who believed that God existed. I'm not sure he came to a true faith in Jesus Christ, but he believed God existed because the mathematical equations of the universe were such that it could not happen by chance. There's just too much perfection. You know, all the planets perfectly balanced like a mobile, all of their you know, gravitational poles equalizing themselves so that they're in a steady orbit around the sun and the sun and the Milky Way around everything else how the tides come in and go out, and if they didn't do that, and if the moon wasn't causing it to do that, we wouldn't have clean oceans. I mean, 23 and a half degree axis on the earth is exactly what's needed so that we have seasons. All of that is so incredibly important, and yet it's all coincidence. So it's, way, it's God's way of remaining anonymous. In Job 26, 7, by the way, it's the oldest book of the Bible is the book of Job, it says he stretches out the north over empty space and he hangs the earth on nothing. Can you imagine thousands of years ago explaining that the earth hangs on nothing? How can the earth hang on nothing? And yet we understand that it does. We read through that scripture and go, yeah, no kidding. But this is far before Columbus where they thought the earth was flat and people would fall off. The scripture's clear. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and he spreads them out like a tent to live in. It says that he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Actually, a lot of people think that it means the sphere of the earth. It actually means the orbit of the earth, the circuit of the earth. He sits above the orbit of the earth, which is even a little more interesting because how in the world would somebody thousands of years ago understand that there was an orbit? This is far before Newton and, and all of those guys. 
So the scriptures are always clear and science is always catching up to what the scripture already says. And by faith, a lot of people would have to read this and say, hey, it says the earth hangs on nothing. I guess it hangs on nothing. But now we understand that it does. So look at God's timing here. He has Joseph in prison. At the same time, these guys are coming into prison. God has a purpose that he wants to happen. And God may have a purpose in your life, wherever it is that you are, whatever it is that you're struggling with, in a place where you're uncomfortable. God has a reason. And if you look for it, it's a wonderful adventure to figure out what God's doing, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. But it is a wonderful adventure because it, it's that hindsight that's always 2020. You know, you guys have read through the book of Joseph, but Joseph didn't have the benefit of reading this. That's true. That's true. And yet he kept his eyes on the Lord. He kept his priorities straight. He still held fast. In verse four, and the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them and he served them so that they were in custody for a while. So this wasn't an overnight stay. And the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined to the prison had a dream. Both of them, each man's dream in one night and each man's dream with its own interpretation. So I don't know if you guys dream. Well, actually I do know. Scientists say that we always dream. We always dream. We just don't always remember it. You tend to dream more you tend to remember them more like before you wake up or before you're coming to consciousness. Or if, if, if you have a sudden uh, fall in your dream and you sit up and you're sweating. You ever get one of those? Yes. I love those. <laughs> Listen, I have no problem falling back to sleep. My wife is the one that has trouble falling asleep when I do that. But <laughs> dreams, dreams are an interesting thing throughout the scriptures. And you can see God talks to people through dreams. They're not always caused by a bad taco or pizza uh, or acid reflux or whatever you got going on. Very often, God speaks to us through dreams. Sometimes there are things that you sublimate back into your subconscious and they come out in your dreams. Then there are things where I believe God superimposes and he can't get a hold of you any other way because you won't pick up the line or show up at church. Yeah, he will send you a dream. And we've seen lots of people in the scripture with dreams, but it's a little different than somewhere over the rainbow. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. And you find the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Well, the funny thing is, there's a guy in the prison whose dreams really do come true. He's Joseph. It just hasn't happened yet. And he's with guys that are having a dream. There was another man that had a dream. I have a dream. that my children will not be judged by the color of their skin, by the content of their character. It's not that kind of dream. That's a, that's a vision of the future, which isn't given by God. It's, it's given by inspiration. And, and this is something that we communicate. And it's not like the, the row, row, row your boat song, which is life is but a dream. When you wish upon a star, it's not like one of those. You know, we have these things infused from when we're little, all of these nursery rhymes and things about dreams and we, we have this concept of what they are. Or the American dream, which was first used in 1931 by a book. Anyway, there's all kinds of dreams, but this is a different dream. This is a dream that God gives to give direction and he has a purpose in it. And sorting that out is important. If you remember Les Miserables, or Miserable, <laughs> depending on where you're from. You remember that song that she sings? Yeah. I dreamed a dream. And she, when, where hope would never die, where there was never a, a price to be paid, where there was no drink that was undrunk, you know, like speaking of her past when everything was good and light and easy and there were no consequences to her action. And she wakes up and that was not her life, uh, the, the, the woman who was in this. So we're not talking about those kind of dreams. These are the kind of dreams that God busts through and speaks to you. Now, there are people that will tell you, God doesn't work this way anymore. But you won't find that in the Bible. You may find that at some seminaries, but you won't find that in the scriptures. Cessationism is not a scriptural word. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, isn't he? 
I can tell you there are countless Muslims that are having dreams where Jesus Christ speaks to them and beckons them to himself. You see, God uses it when there's no other tool around. He'll use a dream. Joseph had two dreams, if you remember correctly. He had the dream of the sheaves bowing down to his sheaf. The 11 other sheaves would bow down. And his brothers interpreted it like that and said, what, are we going to bow down to you? What do you think? And then he had another dream. By the way, he had two dreams. And he had these 11 stars and the sun and moon bow down to him. And his father caught this and interpreted it like that. Wouldn't it be cool if you can interpret a dream just like that? I wonder how that happened. Hmm. Anyway, he had two dreams. I want you to notice that the guys in the prison have two dreams. I want you to notice that Pharaoh is going to have two dreams of these zombie cows and this crazy corn. He's going to have two dreams. But it's going to happen two years later. Ooh. Bet you probably saw that. I find these little secrets and I'm just amazed. There's two, And it's interesting because we're going to find out later what that two means. Joseph tells us in the next chapter. So... Tune in next week. <laughs> and Joseph came in to them in the morning and he looked at them and he saw that they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of the Lord's house saying, why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, we each have had a dream and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Who's he pointing them to? God. Who are they looking for? A human being. Do not interpretations belong to God? And then he says, tell them to me, please. None of you are intrigued by this passage, but I am. Well, first of all, he has sympathy. One of the great characteristics that we see in his life is that he has sympathy. He has empathy. He's willing to feel with them. He's like, what's... You know, why the, why the long face? What's going on? Some, something happened to your face. That's somebody who has emotional integrity, okay? They care about you, and they, they want to observe what's happening with you. They have compassion. Who doesn't love somebody with compassion? I can tell you I'm not loved by everyone because I don't possess much of that. But Joseph has compassion. He sees something wrong on their face. He goes, what's up with your face? Something's going on. And he cares. Isn't, isn't that great? I think it shows a lot about his character. Number two, he's got curiosity. He's wondering what's going on. He's willing to get involved. He doesn't look at him and say, yeah, their faces are all distorted this morning. I better stay away from them. They, you know. He doesn't do that. He's willing to dip his toe in the water and figure out what it is. He's willing to get involved. He's got a courage to do that, to get involved in people's life. You know, you have to have a courage to be able to do that. If you see something wrong, and you don't do anything, you got to say, well, why not? Either you're not compassionate and you don't care or you're afraid because it's a mess. And I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get any on me. It might get messy. Make sense? Yes. Joseph has courage and he has compassion. And he also has humility because he doesn't instantly step forward and say, I'm going to fix everything. They say, listen, we've had a dream and we can't figure it out. He goes, isn't God the one who figures those things out? Isn't he the one that gives interpretations? Why aren't you looking to him? Well, the question is, why aren't you looking to him? Because they don't know him. Amen. So why is Joseph involved? Because he does. He's the right man in the right place at the right time. What a coincidence. The scripture here tells us in Philippians, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility... Consider others better than yourselves. Others better than yourself. Consider every single person that you speak to as being more important than you. Now there's a word for somebody today, probably me. Every single person that you run into, consider them more important than you. What a world that would be. 
I, I, I can't talk to you. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, I thought I was more important than you. <laughs> In your eyes. Consider others more important than yourself. What a great quality. And I love that about Jesus because he always spoke to people exactly what they needed to hear. Not what he wanted to say. I got to just say something. No. He said exactly what they needed. It was tailor-made for each person. And I love that. And if we're walking in the spirit, we can do the same. The surest way to endure hardship well is to take your eyes off yourself and help someone else. The surest way to endure hardship well, if you want to get out of a depression, if you think you've got trouble, <coughs> excuse me, find somebody else at worst trouble. Then you won't be all focused on self. You see, then you'll be focused on them. And it's funny, it's like cleaning your house. It's always easy to clean someone else's house. It's always easier to fix up someone else's house for me than to fix up my own house. It's always easier to, hey man, looks like you've got some dishes here. Yeah, the dishwasher's on the blink. No problem, I'll roll my sleeves up. You're gonna do my dishes? Well, heck yeah, why not? They need to be doing and somebody's gotta do it. It's so much easier to do that for other people, but you go home and see the dishes and you go, ah, that'll wait. You know? <laughs> and part of that is considering other people more important than yourself. But the best way to get out of a depression, the best way to get out of your own mess in your own head Help somebody. And the body of Christ is wonderful for that because there are a lot of needy people here. I'm one. In Numbers 12, 6, we're told this, and then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. The scripture says very clearly, God speaks to people through dreams. And then we have a lot of famous dreamers. Abimelech is the first person in the scripture that God speaks to in a dream. Everybody else he speaks right face to face. And Abimelech's not even a believer. Right. Then you've got Jacob he speaks to in a dream and he shows him this stairway with the angels going up and down. We went through that when we were in Genesis. We see Laban. He spoke to Laban in a dream. When Laban went after him, he said, I'm going to wring his neck. And the Lord spoke to him and said, you better not touch him. Don't do a thing good or bad speaks to him in a dream. There's Gideon in Judges 7, where he speaks to him through a dream. There's Solomon. He speaks to him through a dream, and he says, what do you want, Solomon? He says, I have to rule your people. Just give me wisdom. That's all I want. And he says, I'm not just going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you wisdom and riches and long life, because you didn't ask for the other stuff. Speaks to, wisdom, speaks to Solomon in a dream. Speaks to Daniel in chapter 2 and chapter 4. All over the place speaks to Daniel. And it just so happens he happens to be the cupbearer of another king named Nebuchadnezzar. Joseph, who we see here, the Magi, were spoken to in a dream to go a different way so that they wouldn't go back and report to Herod what they had found. The other Joseph, the mother of, or, or the... Joseph, the, the bequeathed husband unto Mary, the mother of Jesus, got spoken to in a dream, told him, you know, get out of Dodge because they're hunting for the, for, uh, the child, so get out. And uh, then tells him when to come back. And they go to Egypt. And John the Apostle, if the whole book of Revelation essentially is uh, visions that he has and these dreams that God reveals himself to. So God reveals himself to people through dreams. It's not weird, it's not unusual, and it has not stopped. In fact, in the book of Joel, it says, in the end times, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. There'll be young men and old men where God is going to speak to, and one of the ways is through dreams. So buckle up, buttercup. You know, it's going to happen. So if God is the interpreter of the dreams, why does Joseph ask to hear it? with the obvious intention of interpreting his dreams. He points him to God and says, only God's the interpreter. Tell me your dream. Well, wait a minute. If God's the interpreter, well, because they don't know God. They're far from God. But Joseph, he's got the hookup, right? He knows a guy. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 to 21, it says, Daniel answered and said, 
Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So who does God tell about these dreams and gives them the ability to interpret somebody who has knowledge? Isn't that interesting? God doesn't just give it apart from a partnership. There's a gift that he gives and then he enables it. You see how that works? God calls us team members. Praise God for that. I can't imagine living life without that. If I thought God was in charge of everything and I didn't have to do anything, I wouldn't do anything. But if I know that I'm a partner with him, when he puts things upon my heart to pray for, I pray for them, they happen, and I go, oh. it's not because I prayed, it's because I responded to God's prompting. And now I'm a partner. And that's so much better than being an outsider, right? So, in verse 9, and then the chief butler, um, or the, the cupbearer would probably be a better thing. You know, we think of a butler, you know, Jeeves with a bow tie and you know, serving Bruce Wayne or something. He's the chief. He, he bears the cup to the king. The chief butler told his dream to Joseph. And he said to him, behold, in my dream, a vine was before me. And the, on the, in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded and its blossoms shot forth and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes and then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grape and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So that was his dream. I had a dream that there was this vine, and you can see it growing, and you can see the blossoms coming out. There's flowers first, and then they go away, and then there's the, the berries that come, you know, the grapes and that grow, and he reaches out his hand on one of the three branches, and all of these details are important, and he squeezes it out into Pharaoh's cup and hands the cup to Pharaoh. It seems like a simple dream, right? Interesting. We learned some principles because God speaks the same way all throughout Scripture. There's a continuation of the way that God speaks. And you can understand if you're listening and if you care and if you have understanding, the Lord will help you to understand. In Mark 4.13, it says, And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? Jesus said this of the parable of the seeds and the soils. Certainly you must remember it. He says the, the son of man went out to sow seed and he throws the seed everywhere. One of them lands on the path and the birds of the air come and take it away so that it doesn't get to root. Others go into stony soil and then others go into shallow soil and then others get thrown in, but all of these weeds, these, these sticker bushes, if you will, rise up and choke the plant so that it can't grow. And then others of it lands in good soil and gives 30 and 60 and a hundred fold fruit. And Jesus told this parable and the disciples went to him and they said, Jesus, why are you speaking to the people in parables? And he goes, because, you know, to you, they're parables to them. They have no idea what I'm saying. And they're like, what did you mean by that parable? <laughs> See, they didn't get it. They're saying, why are you speaking in parables? Because we don't get it. Well, they understood there was a story somewhere, but they didn't understand what it was. And so Jesus explains and he goes, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand all parables? So there's a secret, there's a key to understanding this. And the scripture tells us exactly what they mean. And he talks about the wheat and the tares. He talks about all sorts of things, and then he explains what he just said. This is what the parable means. But he didn't tell everybody, he just told his disciples. The ones who came to him and said, what the heck does that mean? Those are the people that understood. Those are the people that got it right from Jesus. So how will you understand all the parables? So there's something of understanding a footprint of the way God is trying to communicate that we can understand. So, how do you understand what's being said in a parable? Well, first of all, there's context. You have to understand what that is. And you have to know whether Jesus is speaking literally or it's a metaphor. Is this something that's come alongside to be a picture that's like something? Or is this something that's actually literal? 
So there, there are ways of being able to do that, and it's a whole exegetical class that I'm not prepared to bore you with today. <laughs> so, so Joseph tells him the interpretation of this dream. The three branches are three days. Now, within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former matter when you were his butler. So you're going to get restored. You're going to get your job back. You're going to get your life back. It says he's going to raise your head up. You know, it's a, it's a figure of speech, right? Uh, to lift one's head is, is to be optimistic, to feel better, to be encouraged. So he says, you're going to have your head lifted up and you're going to be put back in charge. So this is really good news, right? If you're languishing in prison and you're not sure if, the, if they're going to cut your head off or not, and you have a dream and a kid interprets it to you and he says, oh, that's simple. The three branches are three days. That's why there's three. And you're going to basically get your job back, go back to doing all the same things that you did. That's a good interpretation, right? It's got to be real encouraging for the next guy. And then there's a small commercial break right here. <laughs> Joseph says, but remember me when it is well with you. And please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. Now, he's doing exceptionally well, taking care of people and everything he does is wonderful, but he still wants out. All right? For I indeed was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that I should be put here into this dungeon. So he states his case now. Listen, I've, I've done something for you. I want you to do something for me. I want you to remember me. That's all I want. Just remember me. It's this little small commercial that's inserted in the middle of the story. Joseph expresses his desire to be free and go home to his father. That's what he wants to do. He wants to get out of this house, out of this land. He wants to forget it ever happened. And he wants to go back to dad. It's interesting because God had other plans, didn't he? Yeah. And now, Jesus says in John 17, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus expresses the same desire to go home. So Joseph and Jesus are very similar in that. Joseph then expresses his outrageous plight of being sold as a slave and being unjustly imprisoned. This slight commercial that we see. It's interesting, Jesus does the same. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long should I bear with you? Bring him here to me. If you remember, that's when they came from the Mount of Transfiguration, came down. There was a boy who was possessed by a demon. The disciples were trying every manner to try to knock it out of him. And they couldn't do it. And Jesus did. And he says, you guys, the reason you couldn't do it, you, you didn't have faith. You didn't really believe. So he, he kind of left all the, the, the second stringers down on the bottom of the, the hill while he went with James and John and, and Peter up to the top. And he goes, oh, how long am I going to be with you people? So you see, Jesus had a desire to go home and be with his father too. And he was outraged by the things that were going on around him. And he says, what am I going to do? Am I going to pray that God deliver me from this? He says, for this very hour, I've been drawn here. And yet we see him in the garden and he says, Lord, if this cup can pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. And we see this perfect servant heart of Jesus. And so Here's Joseph expressing some of the same sentiment that Jesus does many years later. Back to the, our story. And when the chief baker saw the interpretation was good for the butler, he said to Joseph, I also was, was in my dream and, and there were three white baskets on my head. And the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. Okay. Sounds like a similar dream. You're talking about a guy who's dealing with the similar wares of his, you know, what he used to do. Instead of dealing with the wine, he's dealing with the bread. And it's interesting, it's bread and wine. Mm. Yeah. And so you have this situation. So you've got three baskets. You know what a basket looks like, right? You know it won't hold water, right? If you ever try to hold water with a basket, then... We'll have a conversation later. But a basket has all kinds of holes in it, right? I find that interesting. And inside you've got all this wonderful bread. And of course, I love this vision. 
All this bread. He has three baskets and they're stacked up. I notice a similarity. There's a three. There's three days for this guy and he had the same, at the same night had a dream. So I'm thinking maybe the three baskets represent three days. You think it's silly? Okay. But here you got birds. Now, birds in the scripture aren't exclusively evil, but they generally are evil. And it's, it's the principle of, uh, I'll, I'll pull it up later. I'm so sorry. I get ahead of myself when I don't look up here. Forgive me. Jesus says in Matthew 13, verses 4 and 19, he's telling that parable where he says, how will you understand parables if you don't understand this parable? He says, and as he sowed, some of the seed fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them. He defines the birds in verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what he has, what is sown in his heart and he who received seed by the wayside. So Jesus says the seed is the word of God. He goes to sow the seed and the stuff that goes on the hard, uh, on the path on the side, the evil one, Who's who? It's not your wife. The evil one. Some of you are funny. So the, the evil one is pictured by the birds who come and eat up the seed so that the, it doesn't germinate and it doesn't go in the ground, which is the whole point of planting seed, right? So the birds come and devour it and the birds are like unto unto the devil. Isn't that interesting? So there's this principle of constancy the principle of expositional constancy in the scripture. Now I've just gone into Bible college mode, sorry. <laughs> but there's this constancy that runs through the scripture so that you can understand what parables mean and you can understand what dreams mean. It's not brain surgery. In Luke 13, 19, it says, uh, it's like a mustard seed, which a man took and he put in his garden and it grew and became a large tree and the birds of the air nested in its branches. This is in the same diatribe that Jesus is teaching these people. And so he talks about birds in their branches. First of all, a mustard tree never gets large. That's an abnormal thing for a mustard tree. And second of all, if you've got birds in your branches, that's not a good thing. Farmers don't like birds in their branches because they eat up, their, they eat up their, their crops, right? So some people say that the mustard seed is the smallest amount of faith that you can have. You put it in the ground, it grows, and it's hugely exponential, and then all your buddies and friends and neighbors and relatives will come. That's not constant with what the scripture teaches. It means that the bigger your church gets, the greater chance you have of the enemy infiltrating. You see that? Yeah. So I got my eye on all of you. <laughs> In Luke 13, 20 to 21, and again he said, to what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman put and took and hid three measures of meal until it was all leavened. Jesus is in the same section talking about leaven. Now, leaven to the Jewish mind is not a good thing. You're supposed to get rid of all the leaven out of your house when you purge your house and cleanse your house. It's the picture of contamination. Sin is likened unto leaven because it's pervasive. It's just a little bit and it gets in and it ruins everything. We would call it black mold. Any of you who lived through Sandy know what that is. And so this little bit of leaven, although... The mustard seed is used elsewhere. Leaven is also used in other things like Pentecost and the book of Ruth. And anyway, I'm so sorry. It, there's this expositional constancy that this is not a good thing. This leaven that a woman hid, why are you hiding it? Sin is the only thing that, that I hide. I don't know about you. This leaven that's hidden and expands and ruins everything, essentially. So there's this constancy. If you look in the context of what Jesus is saying, if you take that, you can weave it through and you can understand what these parables mean. Make sense? Yes. Now, you can get other people to, to just pull it right out of context. And when you pull the text out of the context, all you have left is a con. <laughs> Somebody's trying to sell you something. It's true. So Joseph answered and says, okay, I'm going to give you an interpretation of your dream now. So Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. You see, I read ahead. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat your flesh from you. 
Now, first of all, you have to understand what Joseph is saying. He's not saying they're going to cut your head off and hang you from a rope. You know, when we say, when we hear hang, we think like a good old Western, you put me up by my neck. No, that's not the hanging. Hanging means hanging your dead carcass on a pole so that you get eaten by the birds. And sometimes they'll stick your head on a pike or maybe they'll put it all around their city walls until natural processes take over and they're just skulls. So it's more like this. And it's interesting that there's bread and wine used in this and that the baskets have holes in them which hold the bread. Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. Every time you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And the matzah always has holes in it to remember that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. Do you see the whole point of all of history is to point to Jesus Christ, Amen. especially the Old Testament. John 6, 51, Jesus tells us this. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Because they didn't get it. They thought it was a literal transubstantiation. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood <laughs> abides in me and I in him. And it sounds like, wow, if I th take that literally, I'm never going to get saved because I can't eat of his flesh and drink of his blood because he's long gone. He was resurrected and <laughs> gone. What's he saying? It's a metaphor. To eat the flesh of Jesus Christ is what we do at a communion. I remember the sacrifice of his body for me. And I have life in digesting the life of Christ in me because of Jesus. And I drink the cup, a symbol of a tortured grape, the blood of a grape. I remember the picture of who Jesus is. It has no efficacy in and of itself. It's not going to heal me, fix me, patch me up, make me grow hair and a, and a foot taller. It doesn't have any of that sort of thing, but spiritually I'm renewed because I have life in myself because I've taken of Christ's life. It's much more than just masticating and swallowing and digesting. Right. Make sense? Yes. That's how you look at a scripture in its context to understand what it means. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday. Happy birthday, Pharaoh. <laughs> that he made a feast for all of his servants and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler to his butlership again and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. So good news for someone. What Joseph said was dead on. Now that's good news because the hero of our story needs to be dead on because if he's not right, he should get stoned to death according to the law. But this shows that he knows God because God's the one who gives the interpretation of dreams, isn't he? Yeah. And so Joseph knows the Lord. And so he, the, the one guy gets restored and the other guy gets hung up according to their dreams. Each of them occurs just as it should. Verse 23, yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. How would you feel if the only thing you asked and giving peace of mind to two people who just had a dream who you were in charge of. You cared enough and were curious enough and you were brazen enough to say, what's wrong? Tell me your dream. I, let me see if I can help you. Just remember me when you come before Pharaoh because here, I'm going to tell you my commercial story. And he forgot him. Thanks a lot, <laughs> butler guy. You know what kind of depression that can bring? And so this is going on with Joseph. By the way, from the time that he is sold off to the very next chapter, it's 13 years. 
You don't know that going Sunday to Sunday, but it's 13 years. I'd probably be more like David, who in Psalm 13 says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul and sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Right? That's all I want to know. I keep running. I just need to know how long. Where's the end? Just tell me it's a year. I'll run for a year. You tell me it's two years. I'll run for two years. But I don't know what it is. How long? You guys get that? Joseph doesn't do that. David does that. I like David. And in Psalm 22, he says again, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, remember before Jesus spoke it, it was spoken by David as a prophecy of the Messiah, but it was a real thing that David was going through. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night session, and I'm not silent. God, what am I doing wrong? I'm crying out. I'm asking you to give me wisdom. I'm, I'm praying to you, and I feel like I got no answer. Do you feel that? Have you ever been there? I've been there. I've been there. Not today, but I've been there. In Psalm 89, how long, Lord... Will you hide yourself forever? Will, you, will your wrath burn like fire? In other words, this unquenchable fire, is this never going to end? Will I be this way always? Like the little boy under anesthesia says, is this, is this real life? Is it going to be like this all the time? Sometimes we get that way. Sometimes we get that way. And so Joseph is forgotten and he doesn't remember him. In the very next chapter, it begins this way, a slight preview. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. What is God doing? He's prepping Joseph for the interview of a lifetime. He's sharpening his skills in the prison so that when God gives Pharaoh a dream, he's going to be Johnny on the spot with an answer and he's going to get to demonstrate to him that he has a relationship with God and all of history changes in a day. But he's there for two years after this event. Two years. How long? Two years. I don't know where you guys are at today. I don't know what it is you're enduring and dealing with but we have a God who loves you and has an intention in every single thing that's going on in your life. And there is not one bit of it that has escaped his notice or his purpose. Our job is to submit our hearts to him and like Joseph, be a good servant and be like a dandelion in the crack in the cement. Put your roots down deep and allow the Lord to help you to bear fruit in that place where he will bless you. I'm gonna ask the team to come up at this point. This is the training of Joseph, the test of serving in obscurity, the test of delegated authority, the test of self-autonomy, whether he can make the right decisions. He's been sex tested sexually, whether his priorities are straight or not. He's been tested by his weakening pliability, will you hold on when God says hold on or will you quit? The test of his honest vulnerability, his unpopularity, the test of dishonest insincerity, the test of his enduring injustice, being accused of something he didn't do, and his unrighteous captivity, thrown in prison for something he never did. And we're adding a new one to the list, a test of repeated disappointment. Repeated disappointment is one of those things that can really be very wearing when you think God's going to do a work and it doesn't happen. I remember before coming to this church, I tried to start a church and I thought the Lord was finally opening the door and then the door closed. I was very disappointed. It wasn't the first time though because I've tried before 
And the Lord shut the door. And so I said, okay, Lord, I get it. It happened to Joseph. It's happening to me. I'll bet you it happens to you. Repeated disappointment because there's joy in the morning when we trust in the Lord. So next week, we're going to look at Joseph's elevation. He's going to get a job. He's going to be number two in all of Egypt. He's going to be adopted as Pharaoh's, like his only son. And there's significance to it. And we're going to talk about that next week.